Hi, I'm Brian Collins, author of Step Off the Porch and Start Your Own Business. There's 5 million new business licenses granted every year, and sadly, 25% of them don't make it past the first year. I'm here to change that. I can help you start your business and be successful. My podcast is going to walk you through all of that. Let's get started now. Hi, I'm Brian Collins, author of Step Off the Porch, Start Your Own Business. This is part five of our podcast. And today we're going to talk about marketing and then when it's time to sell your business. Just to recap, we had in the first podcast, we talked about the introduction and everything you needed to know about starting your business. Then we moved into the actual start of the business and the things you're going to entertain and run across. Then we talked in the third podcast about the seed money you're going to need once you have a business idea and you have a rough idea who's going to buy your product. You need to have capital. We talked about that in podcast three. Then in podcast four, we did a quick example of a six-step business where I had to laminate uh, business cards onto the surface of the board games that I sold. It wasn't my side ventures, not one of my four businesses here. Today, we're going to talk about marketing, and then we're going to talk about when it's time to sell your business. So let's jump right into marketing, okay? From my book at sixstepbiz.com, there's things you need to know to market your business, and you should spend some time on this. This is, this is an integral part of your business plan. Even if you just write it out on a piece of paper in your kitchen table, you might have a great product. You might have people that want to buy this. You might have already raised the capital you need to get started, but you need to have a marketing plan, okay? Things are a lot different now than they were 20, 30, 40 years ago. To start with, where is your audience? Where are these people situated that are going to buy your product or your service? You need to analyze that as best you can. There's things out there in the marketplace that can help you get some demographics and some percentages on this. There's a lot of work you can spend on this, or you can can look this up fairly easily. But I cover this in each of the businesses I've talked about in my book because I had to market stuff differently for each of the products that I have. The next thing is who on your team is going to be making the presentation to the client? Is it you? Is it your staff? Are you doing this online? Is it digital? Do you have a storefront? Is it going to be a combination of everything? Those are some of the questions in your marketing campaign that are going to come up right in the front and center because you need to know where you're going to be able to interact with your client. And and I'm going to have some examples of two of the businesses in my book we're going to talk about in a few minutes. But that's that's a that's a topic that you need to drill down on, and I'm happy to help you. You get a hold of me through my book. I can walk you through that stuff to get started. Okay, like rule five of my book says, if you don't ask, you don't get. So if you don't if you don't ask me to help you, then I can't help you. Okay. The third point is you need to look, you need to listen, you need to find out what is going on in your marketplace and in your area right now. You know, if you're opening a local business in a local community, local city, that's one thing. If you're opening a product or service that's going to be online, that is going to be interactive around your country or around the world, that's a whole different marketplace that you have to try to analyze because there's forces and energies that will help you. There's forces and energies that are going to get in your way and try to intercept your sales for their sales. Okay. So you're going to have to spend some time doing that analysis and you're going to have to step back and say, is this marketing, am I going to put it into a print format? Is it going to be a digital format? Is it going to be online? Do I need a website? Are there going to be social media ads? Are you going to utilize TikTok? Uh, Are you going to piggyback off work that other people have already done? Let's jump into the piggyback because that's huge. There's lots of businesses out there that we're going to be doing something very similar to what you're thinking of doing. They put a lot of time and effort in building a network an arena of sales for them. So if your product is complementary to those at all, you can find ways to piggyback with their consensus or without their consensus, depending on how you market your product. It's not illegal to say, if, you know, this person over here has, has built this, this lovely uh, uh, factory and they, they make uh, X product. Well, you can stand in the parking lot or across the street and you can sell your product, which complements what they just said. That's just a piggyback example. So. It's going to be it's going to be you know something that you have to analyze and I once again I cover all this in my book. Now, did another company 
create the groundwork for you to just follow in their footsteps because they made a mousetrap and your mousetrap's better. I mean, sometimes that's the case. Sometimes there's room in certain arenas and certain business sectors, you know, there's room for five mobile companies to sell mobile service rather than just one. Okay. They all say they have something different. It's all pretty close, but you, you get where I'm going here. So is somebody doing work already out there that's going to help accelerate the start of your business? And if you can capitalize on that, that's just smart business. That's just smart marketing because you can save a lot of dollars that would have otherwise gone out to cut through a brand new forest to, to make a roadway when there's already a small road or, or a, a road that leads up to a freeway, you need to be able to access that. So I'm just going to open the floor for a second here. Eric, Larry, you have any questions so far on this topic? Well, I, I certainly do. Eric, do you have anything? Um, No, I just have to agree with you on a lot of things, especially the knowing your audience Marketing is something that I just absolutely love. Um, there was this when the fifth Scream movie came out, they understood that 45% of the people who go to see horror movies are young women ages 25 and under. So they started an in-universe TikTok account with this character called Two Brash Sarah. And she was commenting on events that were happening in the film as if they were real life. And people were super drawn in to the point where they were upset that she wasn't in the movie. And I feel that is one of the greatest marketing things ever because they understood their audience. There's two people, like I just said, who go to see horror movies what I call the black t-shirt dudes and then young girls. And they were like, okay, where young girls go, young boys are going to go. So they targeted TikTok so well that it was brilliant. And you see that again with the Happy Meal, which isn't a big thing anymore, but it used to be huge. I mean, movies would have to have their dates pushed up. This is not a joke. Spy Kids 2 had its release date pushed to make sure it coincided with the McDonald's Happy Meal toys. So marketing overall, I just I love it because I'm a capitalist. I'm an artist. And that marketing is that perfect place where capitalism and art meet. Right. Yeah, exactly. Right, right. Exactly. 100 percent. And, and Brian, it I, I should jump in here. I really, I really love the fact that obviously, you know, these pa uh, these capsule podcasts really follow one after another, because when you by the time you get, I think, to this podcast, which is all about marketing and then also selling when to sell. But really, this goes back. When, when everybody gets to this episode and ends it, they should actually go back and the notes that they've taken through each podcast, because I would think, and I know that the marketing, so the funding and the marketing are probably the biggest, I don't want to say issues, but the biggest thing for a business to have, right? Because without without the funding you can't start your your business without the marketing you can't keep your ongoing business and and create new business opportunities and i think people will be like oh yeah that's a no brainer but i know for a, a fact that yes eric and i our our forte are movies right and we have a lot of people come on our podcast, the Something Something podcast. And one of the biggest things is, so you made your movie. This goes business anyway. You made your movie. You started your business. You got the funding to make the movie, to create your business. But you really are strapped because of marketing. So, yep. Yep. and, and it's just kind of like what Eric said, the... The creative marketing, if you don't have a whole lot of funds to start, 
it's really now and it is it's changed it's like you said marketing these days has changed over the yeah. last even it, the last different. five years it's, yeah yes. and it's going to change again with artificial intelligence it's going to change again gentlemen eric yes. Larry, it's going to change again so let me let me just jump in and give one analogy from my book so yes in my second business i was i always was fascinated to go to hong kong and i was in my early 30s before i went over i said well i might as well see if i can make this a you know a business trip so i got an option on two condo tires that were being built right on the waterfront in the city i live in on the west coast of canada so i got an option there's 48 units in each tower and they were like two years away and i I, I I got copies of all of their brochures and I got a fixed price, you know, the current price they had because prices were starting to go up in the real estate market. So I went over to Hong Kong on a trip for 10 days. I contacted a person over there that was somewhat knowledgeable of the real estate market over there. Marketing, you know, if I hadn't been able to market what I had in my hands, which I paid zero dollars for this option, this gets interesting at the end. <laughs> they had to buy it back from me for a hundred grand. So in eight eight to ten months, I I flogged two um, penthouse units in these condo towers, and uh, had an opportunity to do some more. But things went a little sideways. One of those units, the gentleman walked away from the from his deposit, so I kept his unit. I put the second deposit down, and the the marketing in Hong Kong was completely different than anything I'd seen here because I had owned, I'd fixed and saved and resurrected to uh, Century Twenty One real estate franchises. So the marketing in Hong Kong was an afternoon. They you, you book a hotel lobby room, put some brochures up, put a few ads in the street and the newspaper, and people that are interested in investing in another country show up to look at the condominium towers because. There's not that many opportunities for them to to jump into these things. So I used the brochures that I already brought from home, had the price sheet on it. <laughs> and by the time I by the time I presented them, the price had gone up. So now I've got a, a gap between what I have to pay, what they're going to pay, because um, I changed the price a little bit because the market was going north. So I marketed two of these penthouses and I was just going there for a holiday. So I come home. And I, I'm, I'm, I'm learning all these things about marketing in a different country. I, I'm using somebody else's brochure, so I'm piggybacking off of them. I don't have to pay for any cost to produce anything. I'm just using the document. And I had a legal document put together by my lawyer that I use for a lot of my business deals that he didn't even charge me for because I gave him 5% of my deal. <laughs> and I now have this option. I've moved two units. So on paper, I'm, I'm making like $40,000 a unit when these two units close. So... So I jump ahead and, and one of these units, the gentleman doesn't want to close on it. So I put the next deposit down, which I think was $10,000 or something at the time. And about, oh, f two months before, th a month before the, the, the t uh, two months before the, the buildings were going to close and you could take occupancy, I had, I had asked some realtors in town to try and sell that penthouse for me. And none of them had any success. Because as far as I'm concerned, they weren't presenting it in the best light because I had to look at my product. I had to analyze the market. I had to see what else was in the market currently for new product that was being built in this city, whether it's a, a condominium, a house, a car or whatever. How is your product the same? How is your product different mm -hmm. from the rest? Well, my product was different enough because it's concrete and steel eight stories. It's penthouse. It's a V shape. It's looking at the water. It's a beautiful location. So I went into three open house, houses on a Sunday afternoon myself, talked to the three realtors there. I said, I want to flip my condo for this house. No, next house, I want to flip my condo for this house. No, I want to flip my penthouse condo for this house. Yes. So within a week, I'm signing up a deal to flip a penthouse condo that I put $10,000 on in my own pocket. And the only reason I got the deal is because I doubled the price on it. Mm -hmm. I put a price so high on the value of this penthouse unit to get people's attention that when I walked in to do a deal with the house, we basically flipped the house less $50,000 of their hard cost for a penthouse. I put $10,000 on. That's just pure marketing, wow. pure marketing, what? pure marketing. And then I had two months left on my option. So I noticed that the developer is running ads in the newspaper with a new price. 
So I went to the newspaper to see if I could run my ads to sell the same units that weren't sold at my price. And they said, no, we talked to the developer and they find this contradictory, but you could advertise in the Vancouver Sun and blah, blah, blah. So I got a hold of one of the developer's partners and I said, you know, you guys are blocking me on my option. That, that could be a problem here, not only for your marketing, but you know, there might be a legal issue here. Next thing I know, I get a phone call and they're talking to my lawyer. How do we buy this option back from you? We shouldn't have given them this marketing deal without some sort of conditions. Anyways, all it was was marketing. And rule five in my book says, if you don't ask, you don't get. So I just walked up and said, I want an option to sell 96 of your units at whatever price you have attached to that document when I take it. And they were happy. And I sold two. Okay. But I also flipped one for a house and I made them buy the option back for $100,000. <laughs> and I was just going to Hong Kong for a trip. That's that's marketing class 101, everybody. Wow. It's analyze what it is you want to do, analyze what's currently going on in the marketplace. And I had to look at what happened in Hong Kong and then back in, in Vancouver, Victoria area. I had to analyze that. And I had to see how the product that I ended up with was different than the rest. Therefore, I doubled my price from a marketing perspective to get people's attention. I'd have been happy with any offer, quite honestly, but I had to get their attention. So I put a really big price on it. And then when I flipped it in the third open house I went to in a Sunday afternoon, the hook just set instantly in 15 seconds. He's talking to his, his partner and they want to, they know somebody wants to buy it. So he walks up there, he sees, anyway, it's done, done, done. And you know, some of the people around me, and I, I don't have a real estate license, okay? Yeah, I own some real estate franchises, but I understand the science of it. And some of the people in town that I played hockey with that were lifelong realtors hated me. <laughs> so anyways, that's that's an example of some marketing. I'm going to open it back up to Eric and Larry, and then I'll come back to another one after that. I, I mean, from my perspective, hearing that, that's just, that's that's guerrilla marketing. Yeah, like there's grim, gr ever, so obviously people have heard gr uh, guerrilla filmmaking, right? Which is just doing it and just getting it done. But guerrilla marketing is pretty much the same thing. It's it's taking what's there, what's at your disposal, and really z you've got to zero in. And and I think, and uh, you know, we've kind of talked about this. You really have to think ahead. I think of if this happens, then this happens and then this happens, but also if this doesn't happen. So there's gotta be that little, that, that, that envision, that visionary of if this, then that right scenario, I think there, yeah, there's, or at there, that there's, point, there's, do you think about that? There's an opportunity um, in front of all of us and if we can, as I always say, don't don't look at the picture straight on, step to the right or left a little bit, look at it from an angle, because sometimes you're going to see stuff lined up behind the picture you were looking at that are going to be integral or necessary in the steps past the first step. And if you can kind of look at that angle, keep an eye on what's in front of you, but the next two or three steps, think three steps down the road, uh, that's definitely going to help you in marketing. Definitely. And, and the signs are all there. You don't have to be a marketing guru to, to plan this. You just have to analyze what currently is going on out there. And it's fairly easy to do. It's fairly easy to get those the, the reads and the vibes back. I mean, I, just yesterday, somebody was pitching me on doing an audio book. And I said, that's great. What percentage of sales is the audio book to paperback today? Turns out it's 4%, which is good. When it gets to 10%, you got to pay attention. So right, right, the correlation right. between the cost of an audio book versus the number of sales of, of the other books I have to make to get four out of a hundred, you know, right. it wasn't in my favor at this time, but, but soon, soon enough. Yeah, so, yeah. And, and really quickly, uh, something just popped into my head is how, how much of, of even starting a business doing, looking for funding and then eventually going into marketing, how much is it? It's not trial and error. But it's one of those things where it's almost like instinctual. How 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 often does that happen? It's like if you think about it, oh, you should do it. Is that a thing? Um, well, it's definitely a thing. It's, I mean, it's definitely a thing. I I I would suggest that 
in today's marketplace, because of the digital online aspect, which, which makes everything that is made in any country around the world now has effectively some market somewhere. Right. What you have to do is figure out how can I get to that market? Because if it's, if it's transacted digitally, it's not a problem. If it's transacted inside your own community, still not a problem, but the gap between there and there, you know, that's a big space. So yes, Larry, you, 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 you have to have a bit of an instinct about what, what's going to track, with the audience that wants to buy it and give you their money for it and what needs to be refined. And I always say just because something isn't sold to the first or second attempt doesn't mean it's a bad product. Just means you need to refine uh, the presentation so that people can see why they need that particular widget or gadget in their world. Then it's easier to market it. No question. And my second analogy, my book, I'm going to jump into next. I'm just going to wait for your guys' questions. Yeah. Uh, it is going to drill down on the on the whole piggyback effect that was uh, very symbiotic, but I'll get to that. So let's just have your questions now, and then we'll go to the next example. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Eric, anything? Um, no, I was just, you know, you're saying a lot of great basic stuff, looking at what's out there and seeing how could you do it better. I thought about that Henry Ford statement where, if he would have asked people what they wanted, they would have said a faster horse. Yes. But, you know, he obviously, he looked at what was going on. How do I make it better? And that's something that people don't really think about. Like, remember a few years ago, the big thing was spicy chicken sandwiches. Every yes. restaurant was trying to come up with that. And, you know, that was just the thing of seeing what they're doing and trying to top it. And so many chicken sandwich places started up because of that. And mm -hmm. I don't think any of them are still in business because it was <laughs> a, it was such a quick passing trend. Yeah, yeah. you're right, Eric. You're, yeah. you're right. The, the, the statistics on business failures in, in one year and five years are you know, they're, they're substantial, you know, 50% in five years, 25% in one year. But, but the, the, the other part of that is there's certain sectors, whether it's clothing stores or restaurants have a much higher attrition rate than some other businesses. That's not to say they can't be successful. That's not to say they can't have a niche. They just need to do their homework on how is their product similar, but different. Who's going to buy the product how are they going to find out, you know, restaurants, it's location is, is as important as marketing. Yes. You know, yeah. it, it, you know, and especially in large centers, if you can't access it, you know, even with the, even with the delivery companies like skip the dishes and all these other things. Now, if they can't access it, it's, it's still not going to work for you. Right. And right. then right. how much marketing, you know, cost per plate that that's huge. Let me jump into my next analogy from my book. Yeah. So, the, the third business I started had three effectively phone slash software slash internet products. The first one I started with was called National for Sale Phone. This is pre-internet for everybody. It was out there, but it wasn't a common thing. So, Brian, this all, what you just said, it really resonates. But I just had another thought, and I think that's one good thing about what you're talking about is it brings all these thoughts to the mind, right? My mind, because one of the things that, that I have to ask, because everybody seems, everybody in your life, in our life, whenever we start a business, a venture, they have opinions about, oh, you should do this, you should do that. And especially about how to market your business. So what, or how, how can you, and it just popped into my head, but, but that's, a, it's definitely a thing because family members or friends or distant friends or even distant, distant friends will always have, have an opinion about how to market. Um, how do you deal with those people? Okay. Uh, and this, that's a very good, very good comment. Cause I mentioned this in my book a number of times and I've actually got some quotes in my book from some very successful business people uh, Vidal Sassoon and other people that uh, the, the long and the short of it is for me personally, um, my dear little younger brother, um, my dear departed father, some other people that were close to me, 
they all of them numerous times told me categorically the not only the business venture that I was dreaming up and starting when I tried to explain it to them they you know it was like I was I was from Mars or something they go what are you talking about nobody's ever done that that doesn't happen and and then when I tried to explain to them well this is how I'm going to finance it and this is how I'm going to market it they're like kid you're you're dreaming they said don't walk away run away none of that's going to happen but I knew in my heart that there was an element of what I was attempting to do was new, was bold, like even turning around those bankrupt real estate companies. I mean, I came up, came up with a plan on how to split the companies, the debts and the liabilities and the lawsuits from the operating entity in, in about 35 seconds. And the four vice presidents in the company that were above me, when I talked to them about it, they were like, what are you talking about? You know, you can't do that. Well, mm. I did do that. So you have to take your own, you have to take your own desire and and mute it a little bit and listen to listen to other people's opinion and then walk away and do what you really think you have to do. Because at the end of the day, they're not going to sell your product for you. Um, you know, uh, well, Steve Jobs was quoted in my book. He says, you know, everybody sees a new product that's on the shelf and go, well, that's easy, you know, but he says, but they all took a long time to get there. You know, none of these successes were overnight. Right. So it's, I would say, Larry, that, yeah, listen to the people around you. Absolutely. But then don't take what they say for granted because they don't have your vision. They don't have your heart. Right. They don't have your passion. And more importantly, they may or may not be risking anything financially. Other people, mm -hmm. I've, I've said this a number of times, and I think it's even in my book, other people that have the head down, walk to work, uh, lifespan and style, they're more afraid of your success than you are of your own failure. Mm -hmm. Oh my God, that's heavy. That's good. That's deep. Okay. That, and I've run into that. They're they're more afraid of you being successful. My little brother, case in point, he pointed out to me so many times, well, you know, that check will never cross the table on this deal and that deal. And I, you know, and then he's, he's seen me on my fourth venture now. And like, he, he, he won't read my book. He he's not interested in reading my book because you know, he just, none of the ventures that I've done, he said, would ever happen. Mm, mm, so mm. he was afraid of me being successful more than I'm afraid of failing. And, you know, the, the best proverb and, and, and quote I have in my book is a Japanese proverb. Don't know who, just it's it's just known to be a Japanese proverb, and it basically it's it, it's simple. It says, "Fall down seven times, stand up eight. Nice. Right? That's like it. That. I like that. And and just really quickly, because I know you want to, you know, you want to yep. kind of move on, but yep. that goes back to instinct. Yep. If you have an instinct to do something, and you don't do it because of what other people are telling you to do. Yep. Oh man, that is. That's hard. Yeah, yes. That's hard. And, and, and that's that's why I wrote the book. And that's why I titled the book what I titled it, because I try to envision when I was 31 and I quit my job and I left and people said, you, you, you're you going to be the vice president. This is what they pay you. You've got a corner office. I said, yeah, and I'm going to jump out the window, the corner <laughs> office. I'm bored out of my mind. I didn't want to be 85 sitting on my porch going, man, I had an opportunity and I let it go by. I didn't want to be that person. So I was Man. willing to take risks ad infinitum. I just didn't want to be the person sitting on the porch at 85 going here. It's not what I did in my life. It's what didn't I do in my life? Ooh. I don't want to have regrets over that. So from wow. a business perspective, I ain't that guy. I've, I've literally run into every speed bump, every foxhole, you know, you, you, you sign a deal to sell software to a company in New York that feeds a big telecom company. And you're driving back to the airport and the driver in the car says, you have to pull over. You have to meet these people in this restaurant in New Jersey and they work for the family. And I'm going, what family? He goes, the family. <laughs> so anyways, you know, just you have to expect the unexpected. And, you know, and it was a good meeting. It wasn't, you know, they were just talking about their public company and my public company and their software and my software. They weren't actually competitive, but they were going down the same channel. They just wanted to know, you know, were they going to be running into anything? And 
And these people kept phoning me trying to invest $5 million into my public company. I said, I'm good. I, I don't need it because I knew where the money was coming from. I said, I'm good. I'm good. Thank you very much. Have a wonderful day. Yeah. <laughs> Namaste. You know, you know, have a wonderful day. So wait, it, it is worth saying, Brian, that, you know, there's a lot of people out there. And what you just said about, oh, man, about there's a lot of people out there that that talk a lot about uh, being an expert on something and yeah. don't necessarily they want, they have want that pre- expertise. I, I'm jumping in to cut you off. I apologize. Yeah. I apologize. Yeah. They, they're they very quick to predict your failure. Yeah. And, and you need to be able to create a bit of a barrier so it's not personal and just say, you know what, if I'm going to make a mistake, at least I'm going to make the decision to make a mistake. Mm-hmm. The mm-hmm. mistake I'm going to make is not taking your advice. I'm going to take yeah. my own advice if it's, and if it turns out to be wrong, you know, at least I made the choice. Yeah. And people have to be able to live with that because that's how you step off the porch and the porch is your comfort zone. That's how you do it. So when you're ready, I'm going to jump into the next yeah. marketing scheme that worked out very well for me. Well, I, I just know that, and we are going to move on. I promise. My last little thing is, is you don't want to be 85 going, I should have done this. I think that resonates with a lot of people. And, yeah, yeah. and yep. I think, I think this whole podcast series, this capsule is that, and, and, and you are a doer and I'll just say that, and you are where you are. Because you've done it, you've been there, you've done that, and you're going back for more. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know. And my first and and, and the, the little thing I would say the first first time I knew I had no reservations about doing challenging things was I got tapped on the shoulder in grade five, and the the, the kid who was bigger than me, the bully, said, "After school, kid in the schoolyard, you're it." And, and his two friends were there. So I said, yeah, I'll be there. So school goes, and as school's out, I walk out into the schoolyard and I'm expecting to see three guys. There's one guy because his two friends didn't show up and, I, and there's no kids in the schoolyard. And uh, this was a Catholic school in Edmonton. And I'm looking around going, there's no kids here. And the teacher's leaning out the window to see what happens. So I had to go out and meet the bully. And fortunately, my dad had taught me how to spar. So long story short, I came home and he didn't come to school for a week. <laughs> if, if they tap you on the shoulder, you got to be prepared to answer the bell. And in business, it's the same thing. You know, like, are you going to sit in the stands? If you get a chance to go to the plate and try to hit a hundred mile an hour fastball, at least swing the bat. Yeah. You don't want to sit in the stands going, I had a shot at it. You know, you might foul off. You might miss it completely, but at least you swung the bat. Yeah. Okay. I don't want to get to be 85 and go, I didn't even get to the plate to swing the bat. So wow. let me jump into the next one now. Yeah. Okay. So the first of the three software products I had in my company called phonenet.com, it was a public company, <clears throat> a, a OTCBB, fully reported company. It was called National for Cell Phone. And what I did is I, when realtors couldn't advertise anything outside their own community because it cost too much money, I strung a series through my interactive computer and 1-800 lines across the country. So people could access real estate database from any city in Canada at the time that was listed and had real estate ads on it for free on an 800 line. (laughs) And the entire marketing campaign was based on that realtor could list his uh, listings on my system so that people in our community or other communities that would be moving to those communities could hear his ads for free. He was ecstatic. Secondly, he could say, to his client, you need to sign the listing document with me because the other gentleman you're talking to, he can only list your property locally. I can list your property locally and across the country. So that gave him an edge to get more listings, more listings, more more revenue. In return, he had to include a 1-800 number with a four-digit code for his particular listing on his for sale sign in his advertising he put in newspapers because that showed his client that he was marketing this coast to coast. And it didn't cost him any more to do that. We gave him the stickers. In return for that, I sold two spots in every community online at the time to the interactive computer, two lawyers, two plumbers, two moving companies, two insurance companies, anything to do with real estate and real estate moving. So there's two in each city. They paid the freight. 
they started at $250 a year and it went to $450 a year. And I had a telemarketing group and they said, hey, we want to send you more business. This is how we do it. We single you out in your community, but we give you access for people that are moving to your community. And we targeted the cities in Canada where there was a lot of moving from, you know, Vancouver to Calgary to Halifax to Montreal. We went to the big cities and then some of the smaller cities. This system worked great. And it only worked great because I looked at the marketing of it. I could not afford to place ads in a newspaper for one week to advertise this company when I started. But I had the realtors do it for me. So I piggybacked off of what they were already doing. Mm. I gave them a product that gave them an advantage over the next realtor. It actually worked. We had these letters of, of uh, support and thank you from people that had moved and used the system and that moving company or this renovation expert or that plumber guy or whatever. We filled up scrapbooks with all the stuff we got in. This system worked great before the internet came along. And all it was was looking at analysis of marketing. How can I market something coast to coast and not actually pay for it? Mm -hmm. How can I use a network of realtors that don't know each other, actually are in competition with each other to collectively advertise me together? And I gave them something that everybody wanted. The realtor wanted this, the, the plumber and the lawyer wanted that, and the person that was buying the house got the whole service for free. So they told their friends, hey, I'm moving across the city or across the country or across the province using this system. Everybody generated my marketing circle. And it, come back to the circle again, Larry. This was just a circle of energy that went around. And I got the three entities, the home buyer, the, the realtor selling the homes, and the professional services, they all tied together to make this system work. And that was the backbone of my software that I used to sell bigger things to Sprint and, and feeders to AT&T. Wow. Big wow. telcos. Wow. So, so you obviously, did you sell that to the- That, that, that company was one of the three companies that was inside my public company. And I had a feeder company in New York that um, collected the third product, well, the second product I, I did with, I was supposed to roll it out with Sprint. Back in the days, screen phones before they were your cell phone, they had these big screen phones in your desk. And they had all these lines and some even had slide out keyboards, but all they had was the day, date and time. So I came up with apps in the city of Vancouver to list restaurants and uh, the special for the day and an immediate fax out if you wanted a coupon or a golf store or this or that. And that information was resident and was searchable through your phone with a little wow. keypad through the database we had resident in the city of Vancouver. So it was a mini internet, if you will, just for Vancouver. I took that to Sprint and they said, well, we're selling these screen phones for back in the day, like $400 a pop. Right. And because they've got all this opportunity here and you back those, in those days, you could send an email, but nobody knew what an email was. <laughs> I actually, I actually trademarked the name T-mail, but didn't go very far. So <laughs> when, when I had these, 10 city rollout with Sprint. They said, you got to do 10 cities with us. I had to phone them back and say, I'm sorry, guys, I can't because, you know, I, I had a, a room full of techie guys, but to my mistake, it was me in the office. I was the president. I was in charge of sales. I was in charge of planning and rollout and going to the cities and doing all the presentations. So the, I went to New York and I signed this deal there for the third product, which was a direct connect button on your, on your screen. So you could talk to a product a seller like a golf store you could click that button you could pick up your phone line because everybody used to have dial-up service before it was fast digital right. and you could keep their their website in your cache on your computer you could talk to the gentleman there before people you put their visas through wow. the internet because back then it was a, it was a mugs game and you could buy the golf club from him and and his information and who you called was resident in your little database so you could go back to it anytime you want so that we invented that product and it worked with 96% of the modems that were currently in place in North America at the time. And they bought this from me saying, anybody with an 800 line, we can set this business up to them. And we actually gave them a free web page. So it was all marketing. We just, that product was just like natural cell phone, but a higher level. It was phones and internet. We strung it together. It was just marketing off of something that everybody else already was doing. We just piggybacked off that energy with a product that connected the dots. I was sitting at an airport after a big telco convention 
telecom convention and, and a gentleman across from me was looking at my brochure and he goes, this is actually really simple, really easy. I said, yeah. He goes, well, how long have you been in the telecom industry? I said, I've never been in the telecom industry, <laughs> ever. I'm just a businessman. He says, well, you just connected the dots between these three circles. I said, you picked that up really fast. You must be a vice president. <laughs> anyway, he was a nice guy. He was a nice guy. So this whole marketing conversation is, it's actually simple to put the pieces together almost Lego-like if you have the correct pieces on the table and you have to go out and search for those pieces, okay? Yeah. What is your marketplace? What is your product? What is somebody else doing? Is it complimentary or is it competitive? Uh, and sometimes competitive is good because they're spending money to market the product. You can say, yeah, that product's bigger, faster, and greater, but might cost half as much. Now you right. just, you know, you've cut half of your budget because you're saying you can do what they do, just not as well, but for half, some people are going to be happy. It's just marketing. Yeah. And yeah. It, it's probably it's probably the most fun sector of everything you do other than selling out. We're going to touch base on that next. Right, right. Uh, one thing that, that you did mention, which should stand out to people, is they, the, the, the business owner, needs to find out and figure out those little Lego pieces. Yes, yes. And that's yes. important because sometimes it just doesn't show up no. Sometimes it takes a lot of looking. Yes. Yes. It some of the some of the Lego pieces are going to be quite literally right in front of you uh as you start your business or if you've been in your business. I mean, my book, quite honestly, is great for people wanting to start a business. It's also very supportive for people that are in business going, right. Am I missing any of the pieces? Mm -hmm. And when you when you go through the four ventures that I've done, because they were all in different arenas. But the same speed bumps, the same red flags keep popping up. You know, you can go through your own checklist and go, well, let's just do a checklist of this and that. Hey, you know what? We missed two. And they're and they're not that far away. They're not that difficult. They're not that costly. You know, it just causes you to step back and, and rethink, you know, what you're doing now to some degree and how can it be done more efficiently? Yeah. So yeah. Yeah. I uh, and I think obviously we're spending a little bit more time on this because this is probably the biggest once you have once you're fortunate enough to start your business this is the biggest component to actually keeping the gasoline to run your business to get it to where you want to be because i think there's like little plateaus right to oh, every yeah. business yep. and yep. every yep. plateau yep. needs a bit more yep. creative uh marketing yep. more funding for marketing right yep yep, yep. there's yeah. There's, you know, at the start of marketing, I my I brought this up. Who who is going to be marketing your product? Is it you, your staff? Is it online? Is it print, digital? What is it? Is it storefront? Mm -hmm. Staff mm -hmm. is a whole nother topic unto itself that I'm not going to delve into at this time. I do cover it in my book because sometimes your staff gets upset at you and they sue you. You have to deal with it. Sometimes right. you want to routine that that person because they have extra skills. You have to find a way to deal with that. So I talk about that in my book, but I'm not going to talk about it in this section yeah. here because it's so uh, related directly to the people that either work for you or are going to work for you. That's a whole nother section. You know, it, it, it is like a rabbit hole. And, and I do want to, to talk about, um, uh, about setting yourself up to sell your businesses. Yep. But I think it is worth mentioning that, you know, all these things, it's just like anything else. You get stuck in a rabbit hole when you start talking about stuff and and especially the stuff that you've been through. And 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 yes, there's always gonna be challenges, especially with staff. Um, so oh, yeah. it's I'm glad you brought that up, but even yeah. and even better that, you know, there's always that, but that's a conversation I think that when people contact you. They can ask you about that. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Like when I, I, when I say in my book, when I say in my book, Larry, answer the three questions to start. Yeah. That's not the end of the conversation. That's the start of our conversation. Right. You know, right. I, I have that. I have time. I'm willing to help you move to the next level because <clears throat> you're going to say this guy helped me get to the next level, which helps you, helps me and helps the people that you've, you're now employing or will be employing. So the yeah. it benefits everybody. We need. We need more entrepreneurs. 60% of the jobs in your country 
come from small business entrepreneurs, 77 in my country. So we need more entrepreneurs because, you know, if 5% of the workforce didn't go to work for a month, we feel it in the economy. Imagine if 60%, if somebody, if they stopped creating new jobs, what would happen? You know, my country would be devastated if small business said, yeah, we don't want to do this anymore. You know, yeah. we're yeah. done. So, yeah. Yeah. so just, just to recap, we talked about in marketing, you know, who's your audience and who are your buyers? Okay. Who's going to do the presentation? Is it you, you, your team? Is it going to be online? Is it going to be digital? Is it going to be brick and mortar? Okay. Then we said, you've got to analyze what's in front of you. Look, listen, and, and, and try to interpret what you see, the signs in the marketplace, what's competitive, what's what's uh, uh, counter uh, competitive, okay? We said, you, you, you need to analyze those things. And then what other companies are already doing something that you can piggyback off of? And I gave you two examples where I basically just put stuff together that yeah. other people had already been doing <laughs> for a long time and made a uh, made a nice little living off it, quite honestly. So, you know, it, it's it's just marketing, it, and and you're just you're just connecting the dots sometimes, in a in a line that are are it's quite near. It's not it's not a big stretch. So, yeah. but that that's how I'm going to wrap up the conversation on marketing. Good. And we'll take a short break. We'll come back, and we're going to talk about selling out. Um, could be anticlimactic for a lot of people, but it's necessary. All I'm going to say is when you start your business at the very back of your head, you've got to be thinking about how do I get out of it? Okay. And I'll touch on that in the next sections. Hi, I'm Brian, author of Step Off the Porch and Start Your Own Business. If you want or need better financial security, try your own business. I can help. Contact me with your first three answers to the questions on my business book website. It's at sixstepbiz.com, the number six, S-T-E-P-B-I-Z.com. And I'll get back to you. This is important. You need to be one of 5 million new businesses each year. Thank you. Hi, we're back. And this is podcast five. We talked about marketing. And I have to say, out of all the podcasts we've done, it's it's probably the most fun topic because Yes, inventing your business and finding who is going to buy your business and then finding how you're going to finance it uh, and get it started and rolling it along. Marketing is probably the biggest section of that, but the most fun because there's a lot of variables in there and it takes a lot of personal fortitude and insight and, and guesswork to, 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 to move your, your product forward in business. And, and, I'm, and I'm anxious to talk to people in my book. So if you already have a business... And you answer the first three questions and send it to me. But you say, Brian, I'm, I've actually got a business that's running, but here's where I'd like you to just, let's just circle around. How can I expand my marketing or how can I expand my my percentage of, of the units that I'm selling in the city? Blah, blah. We'll talk about that. that. That's just an introduction. I'm open to talk about anything. I don't have all the answers. You know, I've started four businesses. There's a lot of people out there, a lot smarter than me, a lot more degrees than me. I got one degree and you know, they they have a lot of those questions that they've answered in another format. And unfortunately, most of those sources are textbooks like I had in university. Right. And, you know, if you can stay awake after the first chapter, you're a better man than I am. OK, you know, so all I'm saying is let's jump into time to sell out. Okay. So how do you sell your business? This is important. So. I've had to go through this a number of times and I'm going to touch base on a couple of these things, but when you start your business in the back of your mind, you need to say, why am I doing this? And what is it that I want to achieve? Is it purely monetary? Is it a state of mental um, acceptance that you're able to build something from scratch uh, and you're achieving some goals Um or, or maybe it's just a project, you know, like like building a cabin. You know, I just want to build a cabin. I'm going to start. And I'm going to build. I'm going to finish. I'm going to move on. Some people are emotional when it comes to starting a business. A lot of people are very emotional when it comes to making decisions that they have to make for business. And sometimes they don't make the right decision. And some people are just completely, you know, devoid of any uh, sensory feeling about their business. It's just a business. So th there's a whole spectrum there. So, you know, I've kind of seen it all and people I've worked with and, and some of the ventures I started, some of the ventures I started, I was happy to sell them because I just did them to prove a point. Um, 
my first two ventures uh, fixed those two real estate companies that were bankrupt. I mean, the last thing I envisioned myself doing was owning them and running them for a couple of years, but I literally bought them, I fixed them, and then sold them within two years. And then I went skiing for six months trying to figure out what I was going to do next. So it was fun, but I didn't want to do it forever. And some businesses, I could see myself owning them for a lot longer. So let me just jump in. So the real estate company. So I took them over my first venture and nobody else nobody else could fix them in the, in the company. I came up with a solution. They said, go do it. So I did it. I was successful. I ran them for two years. Um, and, and the timing of the market was good. Timing of the market was really good. But then I said, okay, I don't want to do this anymore. So it's it's time to think about when to sell, okay? My, my third venture, which was my software company, was a public company. I had three products in it. Each of those products was successful. Each of the products had a demand. I waited too long to sell. Okay. And I'm going to talk about six or seven critical uh, points in when it's time to sell, but I'm just going to give you the little synopsis here. So my, my software company, I put a lot of work into it. There was three products in it. Uh, it was public. The stock started at six cents. It peaked at $8 and 50 cents. I had 54 million shares. My shares were restricted, but my stock was worth just under 500 million US at the time. And I was so focused on the business and in the middle of the business, at the start of the business, when I was took the company public, the middle of the business at the end, I had a, a, had a family issue. I had to take care of my wife who had breast cancer and then it went away and then it came back. So I, I literally stepped away from my business late and... I, I had to give it to some caretakers because they didn't have any other options and they completely messed it up. So when you go to the trouble to build a business and there's other factors that are at play in your life, you need to pay attention and just say, you know what, maybe I can't keep the business for another 20 years. Maybe I should sell it. And I'll talk about some of those points coming right now. But I missed my call selling my public company and you know, there was a financial penalty to be paid. I, I don't care about that. You know, that was 20 years ago. I'm just saying that, you know, there are a lot of people go through that challenge. So you need to you need to pay attention because sometimes when you're not there um, supporting your staff, and I had great staff, but nobody there had the vision to keep the, the, the company going in the direction it was going to go or move into the area that we should have gone into full on, which was apps. I mean, we were developing apps for screen phones long before people had apps on their flip phone or their or their Motorola phone. And, and it was time. Okay, so there's I have seven steps here. When is it time to sell? Okay, timing is critical. My best advice is if you're starting to think about selling, you need to sell it six months before you get to that point in time. Okay, six months before. You should be selling the product before you're starting to think about sell a product because you're only thinking to sell a product because things are changing in your life. Things are changing in your company. Things are changing with your key staff in your company. If you have arrived at the, that conclusion from a purely businessman's point of view, you should have started the process six months ago. Okay. That that's, that's, you know, it, it's going to make it easier for you. Um, you're going to leave a few dollars on the table. There's no question if you're selling it before it's time. But at the end of the day, money's not the only reason you start businesses. I don't care what anybody says. There's there's more invested there than just, just making money. There's there's always more than that. Money's important. Don't, don't, don't get me wrong. But there's other things that are at play that are going to cause you to be an entrepreneur and a successful entrepreneur. But timing is critical. You're going to leave some money on the table if you start to sell your business before it actually peaks. But if it peaks and it's on the downslide, you've waited too long, okay? Some of the other things you've got to worry about when you're selling your business is your key staff, okay? You have to find a way to tie them into, and they'll know you're selling. You can't hide this from anybody, especially today with in the digital world. And, and uh, you, you can't hide anything that companies are doing. So you have to find a way to deal with your key staff, probably all your staff, but certainly your key staff. You have to find an incentive to get them to buy into you selling out and getting a paycheck and going off into the sunset and them still there running the business that they used to report to you. Now they're going to report to somebody else. 
you have to find a way to deal with that. And it's, it's easy to do. You, you, there, there's a two-step thing here. There's an incentive to help you sell a business and a small percentage of what's coming in to buy those shares from you goes into a pot, gets divided amongst your key staff. So they understand at the closing, they're getting a check. It might not be a big check, okay? And not it, It'll be bigger than Happy Gilmore's check, but it, it's going to be a check, okay? So that's <laughs> critical. You got to look after your staff, okay? The third thing in selling out is you got to determine the value of your business. Now, you know, it's great if you have a large public company and, and the stock market tells you every day what your business is worth. And sadly, that that's only, you know, a handful of percentage points of all the businesses in your country, in my country, and the countries around the world. So you got to determine the value of your business realistically. You can bring in CPAs, lawyers, uh, business evaluators, all kinds of people to give you a number to think about. And I'm I'm not adverse to doing that. But in your own head, at the end of the day, you're going to be sitting down across the table with a group or or a person or a team negotiating they're buying, first of all, they're interested in buying your business. And now you're negotiating what they're going to pay you. More importantly, how they're going to pay you. Okay. So determining your value. I always said this, take two years of your net cash flow to your business. That's a good starting point. Because if your business has been up and running, the probability that it's going to continue to run for two to five more years is generally pretty strong. Otherwise, they wouldn't be buying the business from you. They're hoping it goes 10 years, but five years is a good number. And they want to get their money back in two to three years. That's a normal return of investment for people who want to step in and buy the business. Okay. Then after you've determined what the the, the businesses, uh, um, the assets and your company are worth, in addition to what the cash flow is, you know, maybe you've got some equipment in there that has been depreciated to 50% of its value, but it's still worth say a million dollars for discussion purposes. So two years cash flow plus a million dollars because they'd have to replace that anyways. Next, it's what I call the mystery value. The mystery value is you know that the business you have, if it's in a unique sector of the marketplace, there's a lot of time and effort that goes into that. And the company that's buying you has two choices. They know everything about your business now because you've already told them, they've had to sign stuff. And unless you got them to sign a non-compete, non-disclosure clause, which I recommend a non-compete, non-disclosure clause for at least 24 months, really tough to enforce, really tough to win a lawsuit against, but it is a bit of uh, a block, shall we say, uh, for them to just going across the street and renting a place and doing what you're doing. You know, right. you're basically saying you're going to, if they steal your good ideas, and, and copy what you're doing, at least you have an opportunity to get something from them if you're successful in court. And I say if, you know, that's a big if, but ask for the document anyways, because if they're honestly want to buy your business and, and they don't mind signing a non-compete, non, non-disclosure clause, that's a very good sign. Okay. So the, the mystery value is what did you have to do that was unique, different, time-consuming, problem-solving that that company that's buying you would probably have to do, you have to find a value for that. You have to find a way to explain that to the people who are buying you. And if you explain it properly, detail it properly, they might be less concerned about giving you the price you're asking for because now they they don't just see the business that's running after 10 years of operation. They see what you had to do to get it there. That's important, okay? That's the, that's the business value. Number four, closing the deal. OK, once you've haggled out what you're going to get and what they're willing to pay, don't drag this out. Don't go on for months and negotiate in this net because you're going to lose the client. You're going to lose the buyer pretty soon. Uh, your staff is disgruntled. Uh, you know, key people are already looking to go to another company that wants to poach them away anyways. And that's something you got to worry about. So if you drag this out. And I say, you know, if you can't close it in a week, it's going to be three months. That's just that's just kind of how I've seen things in, in my life. So try to get it all closed in a week. Pick a number, get a number, work at a number. But whatever they give you, you know, it's bigger than a bread basket. Just be happy with it because you get to step away. You get to pat yourself on the back. You built this business. You employ these people. You've paid these taxes. You've been helpful and supportive in your community. You're not going to walk away with a check. Okay? Right, right. Don't drag it out. Don't uh, drag really, it out. Go ahead. Really quick, um, to add to that or to ask a question about that, 
is do you find in your experience that the first offer is the best offer or how many times does it go back and forth? And I realize this is, this is one of those questions like, well, if everybody knew, but not to be able to drag it out, what has your experience been with how many negotiating times are we going to do this until we're stalemate? A good question, Larry. Good question. Um, I would say in my personal experience is whether I was selling a, my car, that used car when I was in university, houses that I've owned, businesses that I've, I've had, as long as the person that I've um, brought to the table and I'm negotiating with, as long as I believe that they are genuinely interested in buying the product, they're not just trying to buy something on the cheap. And you can figure that out real easy because generally people who are buying something on the cheap, they're not in a rush to close. They're not in a rush to negotiate. They're not in a rush to do anything. And they just smile and nod their head, uh, whether they believe you know what you had to do to build a business or not. So if they're not generally interested in buying your business and and if you whoever it is do some homework on them because maybe they don't want your business maybe they want your business to go broke they're just dragging stuff out okay right. but if they're generally interested in buying your business it's been my experience the first offer they put on the table is going to be real close to what you're going to get real close and by not accepting it and 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 asking them to to um you know take the pencil and give you another offer their option is to walk away from that number. So I have a solution for that. Okay. In my mind, I want $2 million for a business that I'm selling and they've offered me a million five. Now I know a million five I can live with. Okay. But I really want $2 million. So my counter to them is I will accept your offer for a million five with a codicil that says I get 3% of the net for the next 15 years, as long as it's above what we're currently producing. So you're gonna give me 3% of something that hasn't happened yet, might not happen, should happen, and you won't miss it. You'll just write it off as an expense. But when we close today, you only paid a million five. But over the next 15 years, look, when I sold my two real estate companies, I sold the, because you can't actually sell realtors. It's, it's against the law. <laughs> In every country, you can't sell realtors. So, what I sold was was uh, an option to earn income from those realtors for five years at a declining percentage, as long as they worked for the company that bought them, uh, bought the, brought their licenses over. And they didn't buy them. They brought their licenses over and, and they paid me for the chattels I had in my real estate company, which was nominal, you know, the desks and chairs, and they were just worn out anyway. So I effectively got a, um, a royalty rider on 52 people's earnings on an annual basis for wow. seven years. Wow. And when I did that, I was talking to the president of the franchise organization in Canada at the time. And he goes, he says, I sold a real estate franchise once and I got X for it. And it was over and done. And I was, you know, I walked away with 50 grand. I was happy. I said, well, I'm getting paid for seven years, you know? Wow. You know, and, and I don't care what the number is. It's, it's bigger than zero. And, and I, but I don't have to worry about it anymore. I, I was moving on to my next project. So there's always ways. If they say, I'm going to give you a million five today, say it's done, but give me 3% of the profit above what you're making now for the next 15 years. You won't even notice it and we'll sign here. And you know what? I'll even give you my own parking spot. You know, just <laughs> there's always ways to get what you want without them having to dig deeper into their pocket today. You know, it's like wow. you're financing your payday over 15 years out of something yeah. that may or may not happen, but it didn't cost them a penny. Right. And they can go back to their, their board of directors and say, we bought that company that's worth $2 million for a million and a half. Aren't we good? Pat themselves on the back. And, and we're going to pay this guy 3% of profits above what we're making today. If it goes below, we don't pay him anything in that year. Wow. Everybody wins. Yeah, man, that's brilliant. Brian, that is, I, I hate to, that is a brilliant way to negotiate. If you don't want to do, then go back and, but again, you're the type of person that you find a way, you find a way to get what you want. And I think that's what makes you so special. And Obviously, your book is is 
is unique in a way because everything that we're talking about, this is, you're just scratching the surface. Yeah. I think, yeah. you know, yeah. I mean, yeah. but, yeah. but your experience and, and what you just said, it, it kind of blew my mind. I'm well, just like, wow. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm uh, I won't, I, I won't uh, thank you. Those are, those are <clears throat> glowing compliments and I appreciate that. And you can appreciate, I work in, um, I, I kind of work in a vacuum. I don't have, I don't have a boardroom of VPs and board of directors that I have to uh, solicit views from on any of the businesses that I started. I right. just said, I'm going to do this. This is how I'm going to do it. And, you know, live or die. This is my venture. Wow. Um, but I also don't have a lot of uh, comparables uh, in the marketplace. I, I know a handful of entrepreneurs across North America that I've bumped into over the years that have done similar kinds of um, life ventures where they never do the same business twice. And we've always had some great conversations. I mean, and they did stuff in you know completely different fields, but his four businesses and my four businesses, eight of them had nothing in common other than the two guys doing it just said, I don't want to do the same thing twice. And don't tell me I can't do something just because I'm a single little person. You know, yeah, I don't have the 10 million to open this business. But if I can raise 50 grand next year, if I do this and this and this, I can raise a quarter million. I can raise a million. Blah, blah, you know, you can grow it. But don't mm -hmm. when you're selling a business, don't always tie. It's not like selling a house where you got to move out and it's done and it's over. OK, if there's an income stream that you've created. Life insurance companies sell continuing repetitive commissions generated to a life insurance company to another life insurance company and you get a check and a rider that just goes on as long as they have insurance payments coming in premiums coming in you're getting paid for this and that so you know i didn't invent the concept i just borrowed it from somebody else that does it successfully and, and if we go back in time you know when the british government gave monopolies to people to go around the world and, and try to colonize the world. They gave them monopolies on trade of this and that and this and that. Not the best way to run the world, no question. <laughs> but what they did is they they were the tip of the iceberg of, call, I call it long-term financing. You know, the queen might pay for three ships for you, but she's going to get paid on those ships and the next ships and the next ships because you and your, 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 your crew are going to continually bring whatever product that was to whatever country. OK, yeah. so um, financing this your sale is something you seriously have to consider as long as they, you know, they might have said, well, we'll only give you a million up front, but we'll give you three million over time. Done. Where do I sign? You know, yeah. where do I sign? So yeah. just have an open mind w when you're when you're when you're going there. So I always say. The next point I have is embrace the differences. OK, you have to understand that you're selling your business. And the owner of your business is going to have a different vision from what you have. Don't be emotionally attached to how they're going to turn your business and your product upside down, inside out, and do different things. You have to step back and say, that's them. That's not me. Okay. You you ran it successfully. They bought it from you. They're now going to add this and add that, take this away, turn this upside down. That's okay. You need to be flexible to allow this to happen. And you have to, you have to prep your key staff. That, you know, we don't just make hula hoops anymore. We're going to make this and that and this and that and blah, 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 blah. So, so they're not in the dark about what's going to happen as soon as you step out the door and you hand the keys to the new group. you got to embrace the difference. Master the art of selling, okay? You need to be a proficient salesperson in all likelihood. In all likelihood, you are a proficient salesperson because you, you thought up the business you, you found people that were going to buy the product, you raised the money, you've run the business, and you've been selling your product successfully to the point where somebody is now going to buy the business that makes that product. So you're, you're already a proficient salesperson. Recognize the signs of the person who has interest to buy your business, and then the ability to close. And that's going to be a qualification on your part. So instead of you focusing on a person that is going to give you hundred grand for one of your turnkey products that makes whatever it does, you're now selling your business to a company that understands the product you make. They're writing you a much bigger check, but you have to recognize what level of interest do they have. And this circles back to what we started on before when you said, is your first offer your best offer? 
what level of interest do we have that I can recognize from the people I'm talking to now? Okay. Is there anything else there that, that is going to help me understand their level of interest? So I'm going to, I'm going to delve into this. I'm going to, I talk about this in my book again at six step Number six, S T E B B I Z dot com. Are we are they going to are they going to tell me up front their level of interest? Probably not, because that's showing you all their cards. You're going to have to be able to determine that. And if you the more background work you do on who they are and why they want your product and where you think their product's going to go, you know, and it it doesn't hurt to just show up at their business someday and you know um, by the person who answers the phone. I won't call her a secretary because we don't do that anymore, but buy, talk to that person and bring her a coffee and just say, you know, how, how are things? You know, you'd be surprised what you can glean from the company that's interested in your company just by talking to the person who answers the phone for everybody. Exactly. Okay? Exactly. And the exactly. last thing is I'm going to say is it's called learn and share. So once the sales complete, you've gained valuable information, insight and in starting a business and selling a business. What I've done, I've written my book, and I implore everybody else to do, share your story, okay? The only way, the only way we're going to have true equality in this world, in all of the countries, is if we make the playing field level for every man and woman and child, but most men and women, make the playing field level for them so they can start their own business. I've seen hands-on stories of the people that weave the baskets in the poorest countries in the world. And if you loan them $200, they can weave more baskets. They can sell them at the market. They now can send their kids to school and buy clothing and buy food. And all they did was want to be a business owner. So if we level the playing field, A, share our stories so that it gets out there so everybody understands that the more people that are given the opportunity and helped with the opportunity to start their own business. My country, your country, the poorest countries of the world, add all that up, the world's in a better place. That's all I have to say. So in conclusion, we talked about selling, we talked about timing, we talked about knowing your value, we talked about staff incentives, uh, closing the deal, how to analyze it and raise the differences, be a master of your selling techniques because this is their biggest sale you're going to close and then share it with your fellow man in some format. You, you might just sponsor a group in a third world country and say, hey, here's $10,000, you know, build the workshop and here's the tools. So at least you can manufacture X in your own little town. Okay. Yeah. That makes their life better. Okay. That's easy to do. And probably tax deductible, but easy to do. You got to share. Every time you have a, 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 a success and a kudo, share it with other people because that's how this, the whole circle gets better. That's all I have to say. Any wow. questions? Yeah. Well, I, you know, this obviously is the longest episode of, of yes. the, the, the series. It's probably the most, one of the most important episodes, I think. Um, but I will say this, because hey, I'm in my conclusion, Brian, you've summed up everything that you just, you've summed up everything that you do, including the sharing of your experiences. That, that shows you, number one, what kind of person you are and the type of character that you have to be able to, to take this podcast series and, and give somebody a jump start in a way and almost not permission, but you've given somebody that opportunity to believe in themselves yep. and, and to, 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 to give steps and what really they have to do the right way to to put a business together to 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 put a to z all the way through yep. and and just for me it really ties in everything is by by giving your experiences 
and sharing those with everybody, which you just have. I want to say thank you. I, I knew running a business wasn't easy. I knew running a business had, had intricate parts. I know there's more intricate parts, but just having done this series with you, <laughs> it makes it a little bit more easier to know I'm not an island. Eric's not an island, you know? Exactly. And, uh, just as a wrap up, Brian, you are absolutely an amazing person. And this podcast series has made me, I think, not only a better person, but a better per business person perspective. So I, I thank you. And um, I don't know. I, I can't wait to do it again. I, I actually, I want to hear about all the people that are going to be contacting you to ask you about your Ask Brian um, and your book. Uh, I, 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 first of all, Larry, Larry, you're, you're, you're a gentleman, a scholar, Eric, gentleman, a scholar. I appreciate both of you gentlemen, what you do, because you're in an arena that I know nothing about and I can't do what you guys do. So, you know, I, I take my hat off to both you gentlemen, because uh, you're, you're, you've been very easy to work with. Uh, it's you. been very enjoyable doing this whole project. And between the three of us, I'm hoping that we, when this comes out, this and the other support we've got uh, for my book and the website and the social sites, I'm hoping that we've been able to spur other people along to take that step off the porch. I know for the 5 million businesses, licenses that get issued every year, three quarters are basically first timers. But I also know for the five, for every one person that takes out a business license, there's two or three that are thinking about it. And they're reticent to do it because they don't see the steps in front of them as we've tried to lay them out and cover it. Um, is it an easy process to start and grow your own business? Maybe, maybe yes, maybe no. It depends on your level of um, energy. But is it doable by almost everybody in your country, in my country? Yes. You might take longer to get to each step. It doesn't matter. You might have smaller steps that you're trying to count. Like don't take large steps, take smaller steps. Divide some of those steps into three and achieve them as you go along. You know, if you want to get out of the of the lifestyle that you're in, but you have a job you can't leave, start something in a slower level, slower scale, evenings, weekends, and grow it to the point where it's now has adequate income. You now have to make a choice where you spend your time. Okay. A lot of people call it a side hustle, a side gig. That's what a lot of people are going to do. My book and my rules apply to that as, as fast as any larger entity you're going to start. So I'm happy to share what I've done. I'm happy to work with you gentlemen. I embrace the public out there that are going to hear this podcast to go to the book site, see my book. Yeah, there's other books on business out there. No question. They're bigger, they're thicker, and they got graphs. And if you know algebra or calculus, that's great. My book just tells you the short and skinny, you know, walk down this path and this is what you, you should be looking for. I can help you get there. I got a book buyback guarantee because I know books. my book's going to help you. And I got to ask Brian, which means buy my book, send me your proof of purchase and give me the answers to the first three questions. Let's start that conversation. You know, it might take you a year to get to the point where you're ready to start your business. I don't care. Let's start the conversation. Okay. Because yeah. tomorrow you don't have today. And in my book, I point that out. Yeah. tomorrow today's gone you can't get this time back okay you can fix challenges you go forward but you can't get today back so don't hesitate let's take that step so gentlemen i don't have anything else to say i look forward to seeing this and 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 talking to you gentlemen again eric thank, thank you, you very much larry thank you very much um all the best and and uh thank you thank, thank you, you brian for everything and like we've been saying you've heard everything you've learned everything now, get off the porch and start your business.